Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on stewardship, the motives of the heart. This lesson is entitled, Honesty with God. Now, what do you suppose that would be about? This is lesson number seven in our series for February 17 of 2018. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we bow before you now, recognizing your presence with us, asking the guidance of your Holy Spirit and the blessings of Jesus Christ as we seek to understand this very important and spiritual lesson. May we say the words that you want us to say and may it be understood in the way you want it to be understood is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the purpose of this lesson is to discuss the essential points in the tithing system and its relationship with other aspects of the Christian's life. And the basic question they're going to ask us is, are we being honest with God? Can He be trusted? I certainly hope nobody has any questions about that. The big question is, can we be trusted? Would you knowingly steal from God? Or are there excuses for not paying an honest tithe? Do truth and honesty go together? Well, are we born honest? How many little things that we do in our daily lives are really dishonest? One of my favorite illustrations is the person who comes to work sick as a dog, but they think they can't miss work, and you ask them, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. Is that dishonest? Well, how do you feel about someone that you, have, you discover has been dis dishonest? Is it all right if you cheat on your taxes? Are there other areas of life where it is easy to be dishonest? Now, what's cheating on your taxes? Is it taking all the loopholes you can? Or is it being truly dis... Uh, putting well, if fabrication you, in? If you sit down with the IRS agent in a, in a review, are they going to say, well, yes, you, what you did follow uh, the rules in doing this? <clears throat> if I follow the rules, then it's okay. Well, it's not cheating. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you can figure the rules out. Yeah, well, that's yeah. what accountants are for. Yes. <clears throat> Gary, you want to read us that first quotation there? Yes. It comes from Testimonies from the, for the Church, Volume 4, page 310 from Ellen White's writings. Dishonesty is practiced all through our ranks. And this is the cause of lukewarmness on the part of many who profess to believe the truth. They are not connected with Christ and are deceiving their own souls. Wow. That would, that would have been written somewhere in the 1870s, if I'm not mistaken. Jesus also had some important things to say about honesty. For example, Luke 16. That's 10 through 11. Yeah. Whoever is faithful in small matters will be faithful in large ones. Whosoever is dishonest in small matters, matters will be dishonest in large ones. If then you have not been faithful in handling worldly wealth, how can you be trusted with true wealth? Wow. That's pretty straightforward and pretty blunt, isn't it? So what's true wealth as opposed to worldly wealth? Well, that was a good question. What would you say is true wealth? It must not be worldly wealth. No. <laughs> it must be eternal uh, principles and religious principles. Remember that Jesus talked about storing up treasure in heaven. I presume that's what he's talking about here. So what? what, what, what? Why is tithe so important to God, anyway? I mean, well, what, is, what does money think? Money, what's money to Him? Well, it, money to Him is because there, there's several reasons why it's important to Him. One of the most important is that you need to, you need to give that money to recognize your relationship with God. He wants you to regard yourself as a partner with Him. So and, in order to do that, I have to pay money. Well, that doesn't make what, what, sense. What other way would you would you do that? 
who just say, well, God, fine, carry on, d do your best, bye. Because I spend my money giving it to the, the utility place. I spend my money do th doing this or that or the other thing. Mm -hmm. So what is this going to prove if I give it to him? Well, hopefully you give it to him for a very different reason than giving it to the utility company. That reason is what? Well, the reason is because you, you, you're you going to claim all the promises we're going to read about in a few minutes. It sounds like we've got to pay for them to claim all those promises. No. no it's about, it about, all comes back to the will. Mm -hmm. it, basically, we don't want to have to pay mm -hmm. stuff that we don't can't rationalize and say that this is, this is a good thing. So we hold it back. Uh, but if God says, this is mine anyway, uh, it's a test of our will. Are we, are we willing to uh, be softened so that, that we can respond to what he asks us to do? Or are we going to uh, put up our fists every time he knocks on our door and, and put up a fight? You know? So uh, part of, of our redemption is that softening of the will. Mm -hmm. So that uh, we can d say, I delight to do thy will, O oh my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Well, it's very easy. Yeah, Jim, were you? Years ago, uh, for several years, I remember William Loveless, the pastor here, would talk about uh, where your heart is, where your pocketbook is, or vice versa. Uh, mm -hmm. In other words, he, it was about once a year or so he'd do kind of an analysis, and you'd, you know, where your pocketbook is, maybe where your head is. Yeah. So. But what so, if it isn't, though? Well, then it's you. you <laughs> I, well, I don't think. Where, where, first of all, you can't buy God. He has a. He is in need of nothing. Well, it sounds like you have to because yeah. because you get your blessings. Everybody says you pay tithe. I get all these blessings. My clothes last longer. And they, they tell you all this stuff, and it looks like, well, you're forking over the money to do it. Well, for what was it, 40 years in the wilderness, they wandered around. They didn't have to get new clothes, did they? No. So, your, or shoes. Uh, or shoes, or whatever. Your question is valid, but we cover this in a little while. Yeah. Your very question. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good answers. There are texts in the Bible that back it up. And uh, Anything well, that Jesus said? Well, it started yeah. earlier than yeah. with the children of Israel. It was, uh, yeah, we're we're gonna, we're going to see the reasons in Old right Testament. We're going to see the reasons in New Testament. Yeah. Okay. So, why is it so easy to think that the money we receive as salary is ours? Well, we, didn't we work hard for it? We earned it. We. Why does God say that a portion of it belongs to Him? Is that is that reasonable? You wouldn't work if He didn't keep you alive. Yeah. Hasn't He given us the strength to do our daily work? There's a couple of passages here. Leviticus 27, verse 30. One-tenth of all the produce in the land, where, whether grain or fruit, belongs to the Lord. And then Malachi 3, verse 10. The Lord said, I asked you, is it right for a person to cheat God? Of course not. Yet you are cheating me. How, you ask? In the matter of tithes and offerings. So, Gary, or do you want to be labeled as, as cheating God? Does God get mad when you cheat him? No, he just says you lose. He says you lose. Mm -hmm. So you lose because you didn't pay all of the money. Well, you, d you didn't lose. It's, it's the same thing as when you, you choose to become a church member. Do you, why do you do that? I guess to pay money. <laughs> oh, no. Out of the goodness of your heart, if your heart, God you has your heart. You, you believe it's the right thing to do. Okay, I'll fork out the money and then it'll look like the goodness of my heart. But there's a lot of people who fork out the money because they want to show that that they have the goodness of the heart and they really don't. Well, that's okay. why we can do it online now so that we don't have to do it in front of uh, anybody else. <laughs> well, God is not asking us. This is a very interesting point here. God is not asking us to please be generous and give our tithe. The tithe is His. Well, the whole world is His. I am His. Dennis? This, this desk we're at is His. Right. He created everything. Mm -hmm. So... So why is this tent being blocked off and saying it's special? Because he needs to have a way to support his ministry in the world. So he's got to do it through money? Well, well in our civilization, yes, you go back to the Levites, they were supported by the tribes. Then you bring it down to our day. She, uh, she comments on it, and there are texts, I think, too, to back it up. 
But God could make diamonds and gold and so on and suddenly appear in the church treasury. You know, he doesn't need us to do it. Right. It's we need to give to him. Yes. Right, but he to, wants to, for our, to show our motive to make our heart in line with his. No question, but he also wants the money to pay those that are full-time like our ministers. Mm -hmm. God doesn't the money. Purpose. We need to give yes. the money to support. Okay, Dennis, take it away. Yes, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. Malachi 3.10 is God's command. No, man, no appeal is made to gratitude or to generosity. This is a matter of simple honesty. The tithe is the Lord's and he bids us return to him that which is his own. It is required in stewards that a man be found faithful, 1 Corinthians 4, 2. If honesty is an essential principle of business life, m must we not recognize our obligation to God, the obligation that underlies every other? Ellen White, Education, 138 to 39. Well, we've already looked at Malachi 3.10 a couple of times. That's one, of course, of classic uh, passages on, on tithing. And it, here we are in the days of Malachi, the days of, Neb, uh, of uh, Nehemiah, in which a time when they were go, turning away from God about as fast as they could go. And God says, do you want to work with me or don't you? If you want to work with me, then let's do it, and you're going to show that by returning a faithful tithe. I have my, my Levites that I want to work for you. I want them to, to be spreading the gospel to carry on the, the work of the temple, but they need to be supported in some way. And God, So God gives a very direct command to pay our tithes. Ellen White affirms that this is not an appeal to generosity or gratitude. It is a matter of honesty. God says that the tithe belongs to him. And so he asks us to return to him what is his own. So do we honestly recognize that everything we have comes from God? No, maybe we don't. And if we don't, maybe we think that tithe belongs to us. Well, then there's, that's, where, that's where the mistake starts. Everything we have comes from God and that we owe it all to him. Is that a basic tenet of our belief system? I think so. So we have Genesis 22, and, and this is a story that's familiar. We're not going to take time to read the verses, uh, the story of Abraham, and he is near the end of his life, or what they thought was the end of his life at that point in time. He, he goes off with Isaac, who's now 20 years old, and they're walking three days to Mount Moriah. Ellen White says Abraham did not sleep a wink the whole time. All he could think about is, what was he going to do? Was he going to actually be able to do this? What, how has God responded? Because here it is. I mean, this is the son of the promise. How can you sacrifice him and still have him be the son of the promise? And on and on they went. And finally, he told uh, Isaac what, what the plan was, and Isaac agreed. Amazing. And I'm sure he must have told God, he must have told Isaac, you know, God promised that the descendants, the promised descendants would come through you. That means he has to do one of two things. He has to either provide a substitute, which is ultimately what he did, or he has to bring you back to life. Let's see what God does. Well, we know that Abraham was faithful most of his life, except for a few occasions that we have recorded. He lied about his wife down in Egypt. He lied about her again in Canaan. And he took Hagar as a secondary wife when he was sure that Sarah would never be able to have a child. I mean, you've got to help God, right? Gary, you're, you're questioning whether we need to help God. Abraham thought he didn't need to help God. He needed to help God. But he what happened? He needed to help God? He needed to help God. Who said that? Abraham. I know, but who right, said, right, who, made the, who made the um, um, observation that he wanted to help God? That, oh, that it's there in it, Genesis. Genesis 22. You know, and, and, in fact, in fact, did he use those, the Genesis use those words. That's what I'm asking. Oh, you know, he didn't use those specific words, but that was, that's the idea. The interpretation. Yeah, if you like. By his actions. But I mean, what? 
I mean, Sarah actually got to the place, and I, I will tell you honestly that there's plenty of evidence from the ancient documents that that was the custom an, uh, among the tribes people from which Abraham came. If a wife who, who's considered to be responsible for bearing her husband a son, if she couldn't bear him a son, it was expected that she would choose a surrogate to do it. And so they followed the customs. But God said, you, you don't need to do that. I promised. And so Abraham and Sarah decided, well, I guess we'll, we'll have to do it our way because God's not doing it. I mean, if St Sarah stops having periods, what do you say? Ooh, 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 you know, do it. <laughs> you know. So incredible. Abraham did a lot of things in his life that represented his, his being faithful to God, but some of it is questionable. Hebrews 10, I'm sorry, Hebrews 12, verse 2 says, Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from beginning to end. He did not give up because of the cross. On the contrary, because of the joy that was uh, waiting for him, he thought nothing of the disgrace of dying on the cross, and he is now seated at the right-hand side of God. And we should put alongside that Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes from hearing the message, and the message comes through preaching Christ. Um, so how are we supposed to gain our faith? What do these texts tell us about the source of faith? And what did Jesus say about tithing? Remember? Matthew twenty-two fifteen 15 to 22. The Pharisees went off and made a plan to trap Jesus with questions. They, then they sent him some of their disciples and some members of Herod's party. What they were trying to do is, is pick people that Jesus wouldn't recognize, you know, as, as if he didn't know. And, and, and someone just that was, never had approached him with any questions before and say, you know, are we really supposed to pay taxes to, 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 the, to the Caesar? And what, of course, were they trying to do? Trapping as always. Yeah, exactly. And what did Jesus say? Give me the Show coin. Me, me Show, me a, Show me a coin. <laughs> Whose picture is that? Caesar's. Okay. Give to Caesar what's due to Caesar and give to God what's due to God. You have to interpret to do that because you're going to have, there's no, there's no uh, rules or regulations that to make that happen. You're going to have to interpret that yourself, what it is to give to God and what it is to give to Caesar. Well, Caesar made it pretty clear what he wanted. That's in the laws. Well, you think everybody paid to the exact amount? Well, I'm sure they had a system. I don't know yeah. exactly what I could, I mean, I'm sure we could look it up. Exactly what it was a percentage or what, I don't. I, what if you didn't believe he bo it belonged to Caesar? What if you well, were one of these no guys, what if you were one of these guys that were zealots that wanted to get, get the Romans away do you want to be arrested and put in prison? No. Executed. Or executed? Well, yeah, Not okay, then it's a bill. You, you got to pay it. Yeah. And is that God's side too? He's giving you a bill, so you have to Well, pay he just it? said, give to Caesar what's due to Caesar, and he said, give to God what's due to God. Caesar's is his bill, and so God's is a bill too. No. 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 You, you, you use your head for something besides a hat rack. Yeah. God made it very clear in the Old well, Testament. Well, what's making it different? Because Tell me we what's know. making it different. If you, if you have to Just be told, look at that it's, statement. Probably, it's probably, uh, if, if you aren't impressed to do so, uh, if you've if you got to have a bill. Hey, by the way, I think synagogues, uh, the, and members of synagogue, they get a bill once, uh, once a year or how often. So that's a different system. Uh, but you would have to go to God to find out what, what was re he required. It doesn't mean that he's going to do it the same as Caesar does it. No. That's right. So that's what we're reviewing is where in the scriptures it tells us what God uh, wants us to do with uh, the tithe and the offerings and things. Now, so w w what our lesson is trying to say to us, okay, how do we develop faith? How do we develop a faithful relationship to God? In the, in the Bible clearly says, Ephesians 4, 13 to 15, and Hebrews 4, I mean, sorry, Hebrews 5, verse 14 up through 6, verse 3, that we need to grow up. 
we need to have a, more faith. Uh, and so how do we grow that faith? Well, we've just said uh, from Romans 10, 17 and, and Hebrews 12, verse 2, that that faith comes from our, a relationship with Jesus Christ. So now our lesson says tithing is a very specific example of one way of exercising our faith. It is not a legalistic requirement. It's not a bill. When we tithe, we are claiming God's promises of blessings to those who are faithful to Him. It is a statement of our faith. It is a very visible, clear evidence that we have real faith. Anyone can claim to have faith. And the obvious example of that is James 2.19, where it says, Do you believe that there's only one God? Good. That is, do you have faith that there's only one God? Good. The demons also believe and tremble with fear. So if you just say, yeah, I believe in that, now you belong to devils, the devil's program. Look at Luke 11, 42. How terrible for you Pharisees. You give God a tenth of the seasoning herbs, such as mint and rue and all the other herbs, but you neglect justice and love for God. These you should practice without neglecting the others. What's neglecting the others? Tithing the mint and cumin or, or whatever. So what, is, what is tithing? Whatever it was. Okay. Or I was just kind of finishing my sentence. Sure, sure. So what does tithing have to do with faith, for example? Nothing. Or in this, in, this particular, <laughs> in this particular case, what is known as the weightier matters of the law. Does well, tithing it, have anything to do with that? It's part of, uh, part of our relationship to God. How are we going to... I trust God. I'm thankful for everything He's given me. So uh, this is just part of... Money is part of that. How do, I, what, how do I utilize it? How does God want me... What does He want me to do with it? Mm -hmm. How can I glorify Him with it? Well, Genesis 28, 14 to 22 is the story of Jacob. What was Jacob doing? Running away. Freedom. Running away from Mama, running away from his older brother, older by what, a few minutes? Uh, Probably run running away from his older brother. Yeah. Running away from his older brother. He was scared to death. He's out there, he, new territory where he's never been before. And he finally gets so tired he has to lie down. And he uses a stone for a pillar in a place where there's wild animals, there's enemies. Pretty scary. I lived in, in, in East Africa a number of years. I don't know. It's pretty scary to just go out in the wild there somewhere and stretch out. That's what he was doing. And what happened while he was stretched out like that? He had a vision. He had a vision, yeah. He had a vision of that ladder going to heaven. And this is, was his conclusion, Genesis 28, verses 18 to 22. From the Good News Bible. Jacob got up early next morning, took the stone that was under his head, and set it up as a memorial. Then he poured olive oil on it to dedicate it to God. Can I interrupt there for just a second? What is he carrying around with him? Where, how does he have a big flask of olive oil in his back pocket somewhere? Well, he had to take something with him to travel across the desert. Yeah. Well, well. Olive oil is a pretty concentrated form of energy, so maybe that's a good thing to be carrying. Anyway, I've always wondered that. It would pour it on wounds, too, I think. Yeah, that's true. So, he, verse 19, he named the place Bethel. The town there was also known, was once known as Luz. Then Jacob made a vow to the Lord. If you will be with me and protect me on the journey I am making, and give me food and clothing, and if I return safely to my father's home, then you will be my God. This memorial stone which I have set up will be the place where you are worshipped, and I will give you a tenth of everything you give me. Sounds like a contract. Yeah. Is there anything complicated about paying tithe? Do you have to be a wizard, a math wizard, to figure out, do you need to, to be a tax attorney to figure out how to pay your tithe? No. Not really. It's a simple, straightforward method of calculating. There are a few circumstances under which it is complicated, but yeah, not, not there's yeah, yeah. It's not like filling out the tax form for the government. That's for sure. Jim, you want to help us there with the next one? God's plan in the tithing system is beautiful in its simplicity and equality. 
all may take hold of it in faith and courage, for it is it for it is divine in its origin. In it are combined simplicity and utility, and our excuse me, and it is done not. It does not. Excuse me, and it does not require depth of learning to understand and execute it. All may feel that they can act a part in carrying forward the precious work of salvation. Every man, woman, and the youth may become a treasurer for the Lord and may be an agent to meet the demands upon the treasury. Says the apostle, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath pr prospered him. And that's uh, uh, Review and Herald, August 25th of 1874. That was quite early on, wasn't mm -hmm. it? And of course, Council of Stewards and so forth. She's quoting there for 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. Right. Can you think of any examples from in your personal experience about blessings that you have received because you are paying a faithful tithe? How would you decide whether a blessing that you received was because you were paying a faithful tithe? I think that would be hard to determine. Now I know I'm, there are some examples. I, I will never forget the story that I read back when I was a child. As in, well, I think the, the youth instructor or something like that maybe even a primary treasure way back when. And um, it told about the story about a man who became a Christian. And it was in a time, it may have been in the Great Depression. And he could not find a job and he was desperate. And he said, God, I will pay you a tithe. And he had, I don't know, $3 left or something like this. And he went and paid tithe. And he said, I can't find a job, I need your help. And the next day he, he got three job offers. Well, pretty hard to argue with that. He couldn't even, you know, it says, I will, I will pour you out a blessing so there won't be room enough to receive it. Well, you can't do three jobs, can you, at the same time? So it sounded like, at least in his case, it was true. It is often said that we give, give God our tithes. How can you give God something that he already owns? Gary, you want to take up that next passage there? Yes. Tithe belongs to the Lord and therefore is holy. It does not become holy through a vow or a consecration act. It is simply holy by its very nature. It belongs to the Lord. No one except God has a right to it. No one can consecrate it to the Lord because tithe is never part of a person's property. Now that's based, presumably, on the verse from Leviticus 27.30, which says, One-tenth of all the produce of the land, whether grain or fruit, belongs to the Lord. Now it doesn't talk about cattle and sheep. Does, did that apply to them as well? It did. We do not in any way make tithe holy by setting it aside. God has already designated it as holy. He has the right to do so because He gives us everything that we have. <coughs> Withholding this portion of our income from him is dishonest. Well, there's a discussion in Hebrews 7, which I'm not going to take time to read right now, verses 2 to 10, about Melchizedek. What do we know about Melchizedek? Not much. King of Salem. Not very much, that's didn't, right. Didn't know of any of his, who his parents were. Melchizedek, the name, means king of righteousness. And it also calls him the king of Salem. So it's the king of righteousness and the king of peace. Uh, there's some suggestion that he, he may have actually been the king of the Jerusalem in those days. Remember, Jerusalem wasn't conquered by the Jews or by the Israelites until the days of David. So he may have been the, the, the king of Jerusalem at that point in time. And what, what did Abraham do? Gave him a tenth. He took hold his, he took his 318 trusted warriors and he went off after those people who had, you know, conquered Sodom and Gomorrah and all those towns and, and surprised them, made a surprise attack on them and recovered every, all the people and all the goods that they had stolen, took it back. He says, okay, <clears throat> I've got all these spoils from this attack against my enemies. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a portion to the Lord. And in that case, he gave it to whom? No, Melchizedek. He must have been a rather remarkable uh, person. Melchizedek or Abraham or both? 
Well, I'm thinking about Melchizedek right yeah. now because, uh, you know, that wasn't all that far since the time of the Tower of Babel. Right. And uh, here, uh, well, Abraham came out of a very pagan culture. Mm. And uh, yet he could recognize something about this, uh, this king of Salem uh, or, or Melchizedek. Was yeah. a king of righteousness. Uh, that's a pretty amazing. Yeah. One of we, the speculations is that it was uh, um, was Shem, because he he would have still been alive. In fact, he outlived Abraham, and so he would have been the reigning patriarch in a sense at that time. But that's all just speculation. Yeah, I don't think he would have been down in Canaan, living among all. I don't know. Why would this Melchizedek? Be, you know, living down there if he was. The only thing we can conclude is that some, for some reason, he either because he came from a line of faithful people who had eventually disappeared, or he himself somehow or other had a relationship with God, and obviously Abraham recognized that this guy was a saint. He's someone kind of like Job. Mm -hmm, yeah. You know, where's Job? Where did Job come from? Where did he go? Where did yeah. his family go? Well, Abraham paid a tithe of the spoils of war to him, so that was quite a rich bounty that he got. Now, we recognize this, that the Sabbath is holy. It is our day to communicate with and celebrate with God. We do not make the Sabbath holy by keeping it. We recognize that it is so designated by God. Our tithe should be regarded in the same way. It is set apart for sacred use. That is the meaning of holy in the Bible. And Gary, I think we have a passage there for us. In like manner, a tithe of our own of our income is holy unto the Lord. The New Testament does not reenact the law of the tithe as it does not that of the Sabbath. For the validity of both is assumed and their deep spiritual import explained. God has made an absolute reservation of a specific portion of our time and our means. To ignore these claims is to rob God. Christians boast that their privileges far exceed those of the Jewish age Shall we then be content to give less to the cause of God than did his ancient people? The tithe was about a part of their liabilities. Liberalities. Liberalities, I mean. Numerous other gifts were acquired besides required, required besides the free will offering our offerings of gratitude, which was then, as now, our perpetual obligation. While we, as a people, are seeking faithfully to give to God the time which he has reserved as his own, shall we not also render to him that portion of our means which he claims. That would be from Review and Herald, May 16, 1882, paragraphs 28 to 30, and it's repeated in Councils on Stewardship, page 66. So does paying a faithful tithe on a, on a regular basis help us to grow our faith? Does it help us to recognize our dependence on our relationship with God? How would you determine if a new blessing which you have experienced was a result of God rewarding you for paying of your tithe. Hezekiah was one of the few bright lights among the kings of ancient Judah. He did many things to bring the people of Judah back into a correct worship of God. Now considering the story of the time of Judges and all the other stuff that had gone on before this, how do you suppose, I mean, what did Hezekiah do to basically turn the whole nation back to God, at least temporarily? I mean, it just, it was amazing what he did. You can read about it in 2 Chronicles 29-31. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. 
He set in order the house of the Lord. They kept the Passover for the first time for a long time. As a, res as a result, there was great joy in Jerusalem. Pagan images, altars, and the high places were destroyed. As a result, there was, an, there was a revival of heart and a reformation of practice, resulting in an abundance of tithing and offerings. Amazing. Several hundred years later, Nehemiah gave another example of revival, reformation, and tithing. Found, you read about that in Nehemiah 9, 2 and 3, and 13, 1 to 31. Uh, let me just read two of those verses. For about three hours the law of the Lord their God was read to them, and for the next three hours they confessed their sins and worshipped the Lord their God. So what, what, was, what happened there? They built a platform. The priests got up, and remember, they no longer spoke Hebrew. They were now speaking Aramaic. They got up on the platform. Ezra apparently read the passage in, in Hebrew. It was translated and made plain by the other priests that were standing beside him, explained in Aramaic. So that would be the first modern language translation. And it was so impressive that the children of Israel basically transformed their ways and spent three hours confessing their sins. What do you suppose would happen today if you get down on the street somewhere here and spent three hours reading from Scripture? 5150. <laughs> <laughs> you might end up in the Looney Tunes, right? You might be ignored. Yeah. It might be. So what's the difference between revival and reformation? <clears throat> Gordon, you got something on that? I think Dennis. it's... I think I'm it's sorry, Dennis, I'm sorry. Revival and Reformation are two different things. Revival signifies a renewal of spiritual life, a quickening of the powers of mind and heart, a resurrection from the spiritual death. Reformation signifies a reorganization, a change in ideas and theories, habits, and practices. Okay. Can we claim to be God's faithful people to be looking for revival, reformation, and finish the finishing the gospel if we are not faithful in our paying of tithe? Would it be like expecting your car to continue to travel without putting gasoline in the tank? I had a great privilege today. One of my fellow workers showed up today with an all-electric car and he said, come out and drive it, see what you think. Pretty impressive. He never has to put any gasoline in that tank at all. He just plugs it in. Revival and Reformation are an essential part of the Christian's experience and it happens inside the church. It is not the actual paying of tithe that makes a difference. It is our decision and emotions that are connected with that act that makes a real difference. So why is it the decision and emotions that's important? The motives. It represents our motives, right? We're talking about that's the, that's the title of the whole quarter. Mm-hmm. So why is, that, why is that important? It's part of our growth. Mm -hmm. It's part of our inner character and our, what drives us. It's a part of, of faith. It sharpens our spiritual vision. It renews our commitment to honesty. Now the lesson suggests we look at Jeremiah 31 and Hebrews 8, which basically say the same thing. I'm going to read from Jeremiah 31 in the Good News Translation. The Lord says, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant. What's a covenant? Contract. A contract, an agreement. So Gary, here's, here's a contract with God. With the people of Israel is what he says at that time, and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizens to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. Very interesting. This is, I will no longer remember. Does that mean there's something wrong with the Lord's memory? I will no longer hold it against them. Okay. If we come to develop that kind of relationship with God, we will see a constant growth in our faith. So this new covenant experience, we, we, we call it the new covenant experience, is spoken of in several places in the Bible. 
Shouldn't we desire the new covenant experience? If we pay a faithful tithe, are we not rejecting the materialistic principles of consumerism that seem to dominate our world? Well, what about going back to Malachi 3, verses 9 to 10? Could we claim this as being still effective in our day? It says, the Lord said, A curse is on all of you because the whole nation is cheating me. Bring the full amount of your tithes to the temple so that there will be plenty of food there. Put me to the test and you will see that I will open the windows of heaven and pour out on you the in abundance all kinds of good things. Jim, you want to read to us that next passage? A close selfish spirit a close selfish spirit seems to prevent men from giving to God his own. The Lord made a special covenant with men that if they would regularly set apart the portion designated for the advancement of Christ's kingdom, the Lord would bless them abundantly, so that there would be no room to receive his gifts. But if men withhold that from which belongs to God, the Lord plainly declares, Ye are cursed with a curse. Malachi 3.9 Review and Herald of December 17, 1889 and quoted in Councils and Stewardship, page 77. Ancient Israel lost its special relationship with God and ultimately was destroyed as a nation because while they claimed the privileges of that special relationship, they rejected the responsibilities. If we, as Christians, claim to be careful followers of God and we, we, we claim a, a position in, in the heavenly kingdom, and we don't bear our responsibilities, including paying a tithe, are we, are we being dishonest? Well, I think so. You think so? <coughs> well, if we say that we're part of God's kingdom, but we're in turn seeking to build up our own kingdom instead of His, then... Um, that would be, in a sense, dishonest. Uh, we should be seeking to build his kingdom, not ours. Yeah, exactly. Well, coming down to the very practical questions, what do you say to someone who says, I just can't afford to pay tithe? Are they actually saying that they do not trust God? Is such a person rejecting the idea that tithe is actually holy? Well, I think you'd have to come close and know the person to really okay. have a definitive answer to mm -hmm. that, you know, because some people would, uh, they may not be very good stewards, they may be, have previously gotten deeply in debt where they can't keep up with things, they can't keep mm -hmm. afloat hardly, they're facing bankruptcy and they would say, well, I, I can't. <coughs> Uh, from that perspective. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how does God feel about that? If you need, I mean like the guy who had three dollars left and paid 30 cents in tithe and ended up with three job offers, mm -hmm. maybe the person who needs to pay tithe most of all is the one who's apparently in all kinds of trouble financially. I don't know, it sounds like God is prepared to give a pretty generous blessing. Well, uh, have any of you had any experiences of yourself personally or somebody you know who, who, who got a, a very definite blessing because they started paying tithe or maybe did at one point and then stopped? I think some of this is easier to see in a more agrarian society. I remember as a child, I uh, was an elderly Adventist farmer, and on two different occasions, and he was a wheat and sheep farmer and oats and stuff. And that's, to harvest it, it's got to be dry, and just mm -hmm. right, and it can burn. Two separate occasions, there was fire started on neighboring farms. He never lost a grain. It came right up to his boundary, two different occasions. Mm. Never burned, everything else about it did. And he was a known tithe payer and a pillar of the church. i never forget that. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know, the statement that Jesus made, whoever is faithful in small matters will be faithful in large ones. Whoever is dishonest in small matters 
will be dis dishonest in large ones. Is tithing a small matter? I don't think so. I mean, God has to figure out. I mean, sure, Gordon says he could just somehow rather drop diamonds out of the sky or something. But God has to have some means of, of supporting God, his work. And he has chosen this means. Are we saying, it's okay, God, for you to do this, we'll join with you? Are we saying, we don't like the way you do it? Or we're saying, what are we saying if we, if we don't pay tithe? Or are we saying, maybe we don't like the way that God's representatives in the church are handling the finances? And what about that? Does that give us a, an excuse for not paying our tithe? Well, it depends if the person puts his tithe somewhere else. If he doesn't, well, then maybe he's being a little bit disingenuous. Is it all right if you say, well, God, I'm really short on cash this month. I'll pay tithe next month. Is that a fair thing to do? Well, it's legal, isn't it? It pays up the bill. Well, what difference would it make to modern Christians if they truly lived in partnership with God? If a significant number of us actually did that truly in partnership with God, would it, would it be a very short time until we were in the kingdom? Well, here's an interesting idea. Think about this. Times were really tough. She had nearly exhausted all her resources. As with other widows of the time, her life was tenuous at best. Drought had engulfed the land so much so that even wives with husbands to provide for them and their families found making ends meet an almost unachievable challenge. Her cupboards were virtually bare and there was just enough to prepare one final meal for her son and herself. The future was bleak indeed. Then the prophet Elijah enters the scene. He asks the widow for a favor. For a cup of water, but that but what he does next seems unusually callous. Elijah said to her, Do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first, and bring it to me, and afterward make some for yourself and your son. The man, however, comes with a promise. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day of the Lord sends rain on the earth. 1 Kings 17, 14. And of course, you know the story of the widow of Zarephath. She acted in faith and did as Elijah had instructed. God in turn honored her faith, making good on his promise to sustain her and her son. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom. Our study this week likewise calls us to seek God's kingdom first by returning an honest tithe. But it couples that call with the divine promise that builds our faith. And that's from our Bible study guide, page 94, from the Teacher's Bible Study Guide, page 94. Some of you know, but I thought I would mention this just right now. Where is Zarephath located? It's north of Israel, isn't it? North of Israel? Yeah. Where else? Where? where? Iron Sidon area, somewhere. Okay. Uh, let me do it for this way, for the, for the camera. Tyre is here and a little bit further north, both right on the coast, is Sidon. And who was the queen of Israel in the days of Elijah? Jezebel. Jezebel. Where did she come from? Iron Sidon. Sidon. Her, her father was the, was the king of Sidon. Okay? And the, the, and the priest of, high priest of Baal, by the way, at the same time. So where does God send, you know, and, and Ahab and, and, and Jezebel had sent people all over the place, all the country, surrounding countries, find this guy and send him back to us. We will deal with him. So where does God send him to hide? Right, <laughs> under, the nose right of under the nose of, of Jezebel's father. I, have to, I just have to chuckle every time I think about that. Here he is like right under. <laughs> Would you agree that God's faithfulness is never in doubt, but it is, for, is forever doubted? Would you call that an oxymoron? What's an oxymoron? Opposing ideas. Very, very opposite ideas, isn't it? Think about the people who studied in this lesson who paid a faithful tithe. Did God reward them as he promised? Yeah. Did God reward Abraham? Yeah. 
did he did he reward Jacob? Did he reward him with four wives? Oh well, maybe that was a little more than he needed, right? More than he bargained for. But he did have his cattle. His cattle and his sheep were multiplied, weren't they? Yeah. Just amazing. Maybe those multiple wives were actually a curse instead of a blessing from God. <laughs> Unfortunately, each new generation must establish once again its relationship with God. And that's where the problem lies. There is every reason to believe that God would be delighted to demonstrate his trustworthiness to anyone who tests him. Are we willing to try? Are we willing to admit and practice the truth that a portion of our income called the tithe, what does tithe mean? Tenth. It means a tenth. The tithe does not belong to us at all. I, I mean, I know, uh, growing up, the idea was, okay, you've got to be faithful to God, so you give him your tithe. In other words, you, you're, you're, giving, you're giving something from yourself to God. That's not the truth, not according to the Bible. The truth according to the Bible is it belongs to him. So if you keep it back, you're stealing from God. So what does it mean 10% belongs to God? Well, it all belongs to him, but he only asks for the ten percent back. Uh, up, you know, uh, it's almost because we're going to be talking in a couple of weeks here about free will offerings, which go beyond that. Mm -hmm. But he only is asking for a tenth mm -hmm. uh, up front, and that sort of signifies that we acknowledge that that he owns it all. You're walking down the street, and there's an envelope with something in it lying on the street, and you pick it up, and there's a couple thousand dollars in it. Would you claim it as yours? Would you, would you try to find who it belonged to? Now you'd look at the envelope to see if there was anything on it, or if anybody had written something on one of the bills. Might ask some of the neighbors. Yeah. Um, we had hard to say. It could be, could have fallen it, it, out of a passing car that yeah. was coming from way over there. If you if you found there. out by some kind of means, who 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 lost it? Would you feel like you need to return it? Yes. 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 We had an incident of that down in L.A. just recently. Mm -hmm. You could also turn it into the police department because somebody might be looking for them and they would be the clearinghouse for, yeah. for that sort of thing. Well, God says that tithe which you have in your pocket or in your hand belongs to me. So is that different? Going back to that story for just a minute, um, that hypothesis, finding money, today I would suspect that $2,000 found in an envelope would be drug money, and that the person who <laughs> in, lost it would not... In our part not, of the world. Yes, in our part of the world. A person who lost it would not be going to the police asking for, <laughs> for that money. Yeah. But you turn it into the police, and, yeah. and they probably have rules in if, regard if to... It's not claimed how, within X then number certain, of then you, days then or weeks. They yeah. might give it to you. I don't know what they're... I had a very interesting experience I'll mention just briefly. Um, I went with a mission group to Cuba recently and had a wonderful time there. Uh, the people are quite poor, more, many of them, but they're wonderful people, very friendly, very likable people. And I was coming home, checking out in the airport, checked my luggage in, went out with my hand luggage, went through all the checking and things. Waiting, I was sitting waiting for the plane to depart. The, the plane, the, we, we got there quite a bit, quite, quite a bit early because we wanted to make sure we wouldn't have any problems. So we were sitting there waiting for the plane to depart, and the lady came over and said, are you, are you Kenneth Hart? Yeah, well, come. And I don't know, I have no idea why they did this, but they had brought my luggage out that I had checked in. They brought my hand luggage and they went through it with a fine tooth comb, everything. They looked at it like this and they were checking it with their machines and so forth. I don't know whether they thought because I was a doctor, maybe I had some drugs or something with me. I just stood there. I mean, there was, it was a couple ladies going and then they wanted to expect me, you know, with the, the thing up and down and all over to see. 
Finally got all done. They didn't say anything. Just put everything back in. Thank you. Bye. So was this in Cuba? This was in Cuba. Yeah. What do you do? I mean, you, you, you sit there and you feel like, you know, I must be a criminal, you know. <laughs> well, well, I don't we? know what the rules are there, but yeah. in other airports, you, as I've experienced recently, you just go through and every, you know, then the light flashes and say, step aside, you, you've been selected to be yeah. tested and they run the wand over but they you. Usually don't, that usually doesn't happen after you're completely checked in and you're sitting at the gate. No. no. So I, I don't know. Well, shouldn't we be happy to enter in a partnership with God for which He promises blessings? How could we lose? Is it paying, paying a faithful tithe one method of storing up treasure in heaven? Is God taking a chance on us by giving us the tithe along with the rest of our income? Is it really possible that God could bless us so that we, we would do better with the 90% than we do with the 100%? Is that possible? I don't think God is in the business of taking chances. I no. think the Infinite One knows. <laughs> He does not need us to. Yeah. Well, in our consumer society, we depend on money for almost everything we do. Is it, is it safer to trust in our bank accounts and our retirement funds instead of trusting God? Do we believe that God takes care of those who take care of themselves? Some people do. Have you found that paying, f paying a faithful tithe increases your faith, or does it take a lot of faith to pay tithe? Or both? You know, you use the word faith. I, I, if we've used that word faith, belief, trust, con, uh, confidence, confidence, and uh, anyway, one of the first definitions is persuasion, mm -hmm. and persuasion is a process. Mm -hmm. It's a learning process. You learn that you can trust the the person, or but uh, because over time it's it's consistently uh, born borne out or born out. So I, I kind of like uh, kind of leaning toward that word persuasion. It's a process. It's not something that's infused in you. Mm -hmm. God communicates you through words, logos, and symbols, words being yeah. symbols of ideas. He wants to educate you. So yeah. that's what I... I well, should faithful tithe payers as a part of that process be trying to convince others to pay a faithful tithe? Is that part of your responsibility? Is it part of my responsibility? What does God want us to do with this faithful tithe? Our kind and loving Father, we trust you. We believe that your blessings are very important to us. We, 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 we realize that we receive your blessings in great amounts every day just by the mere, mere fact that we keep breathing and our heart, keep, hearts keep beating. And yet it's so easy to sometimes think that we do this, we do that, and we earn this, and this money belongs to us. Help us not to take that attitude, but to recognize that everything we have, we've been given by you. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.